Welcome to Rex's Bible Minute, a weekly video where we talk about Jesus, Christianity, and anything along those lines. And we are starting a study of Revelation uh, this week, and I am absolutely intimidated by it, but uh, I'm really convicted. I feel like I need to do this, not because I'm something special, but just because this is one of those parts of the Bible that uh, it's misunderstood a lot. And I, I really think that's, that comes down to a lack of teaching on it, because Guys who do the teaching are, tend to be scared about it, and the guys who aren't scared to do it probably don't need to be teaching it, you know? Uh, it's, it's one of those books that it's, it's a part of the Bible that's not easily understood. Um, it's not one that you can just sit down and, and get everything out of without any other study, without any other context, without any of the background. Like, no, you've, you've got to do your homework on this one, and I think that's why it's so intimidating for so many pastors. Um, on top of the fact that there, it's not an easy read, just in general. Like, if you go to external sources, like people who study ancient texts, which the Bible is. I mean, it's a collection of ancient writings. Um, Revelation always ranks up there as one of those most, just as a piece of art, impressive. Like, right, just as an ancient writing, it's it's very, very well put together. It's very smart and intelligent and creative. Um, and so to study it and to read it and understand it in the way that it's meant to be understood is really difficult, and it gets done poorly a lot. So my prayer for this study of the book of Revelation is that it will help each of us, including myself, understand it a little bit better. I don't expect us to have it all figured out. We've got 2,000 years of church history that says we won't, right? But my prayer is that you will understand it better, that you will have a better grasp, at least of the different ways of understanding it and why you would think those things, instead of just blindly pointing at somebody else, it's like, see, that's what they said, they've got to be right. Like, that's not what I want this to be. I want this to be a, you will understand why you believe what you believe about it, or maybe you'll start to even come to some conclusions about it, because that, for me, that's that's a big thing. Like, I've read and understood as best I can all the different understandings of parts of this book, but even with it, I still, like, there's a lot of question marks for me. Um, and so we're going to go through this together. I don't, I'm not professing to have all the answers. I'm not professing to say this is exactly the right way to understand each and every verse. Like, no, I'm not going to give that to you because I don't have that. <laughs> I'd be a liar. Uh, but what I do promise is, is to give you as, as much perspective and context and true, truthful application as we can for each and every verse. Um, this is probably going to take a while, so I, I really wouldn't be shocked if this time next year we're still in the book of Revelation. Maybe not, who knows, maybe we could hit our stride and get through this pretty quickly. Um, but I really expect us to, to, to be in this book for a while. Um, and so like I start every single study, and really like I start every single one of these uh, lessons, uh, I, let's look at the context. There's three things we absolutely have to figure out uh, in order to understand this properly. The first three, those three things, I'm sorry, are who wrote it, who they're writing to, and why. You know, the background kind of stuff, right? Um, and so the first thing is is who wrote it. Well, the book itself says it was written by a guy named John, who describes himself as a slave of Jesus uh, and as a prophet, basically. That's the way the book itself um, describes it. Now, Tradition tells us that this was John the Apostle, right? The guy who wrote the Gospel of John and the, the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, that's been the traditional understanding. So let's look at that. Like, do, Is there a good reason to believe that, or is that just kind of what's been handed to us? Um, the, the best evidence for this uh, comes down to two things for me. The first one is the early church, the first, you know, three, four hundred years of the church. This was unanimous. Like, there was no question marks here amongst those guys. Amongst the early writings, it was, they thought it was John the Apostle. So, yeah, like, that to me is a major, like, thumbs up, this was the Apostle, because those are the guys who could have asked the guys who were there, right? Um, and so that's a big piece of, of pro-John the Apostle. Um, the other is there are a lot of theological and stylistic similarities between the Gospel of John, which we're pretty convinced was John the Apostle, uh, and this letter. There's a lot of, of similarities in the way they write, a lot of theological similarities, the way they talk about Jesus and the things of God. So those are the two biggest pieces of evidence is that this was. The timeline also matches up. We're pretty sure John uh, was active when this letter was written. All right? So what about not the Apostle? Well, 
first thing we have to understand is that John was was just as common of a name back then as it is today. Like it's not like there were a lot of early church leaders and, and, and important guys within the first 200 years of the church named John. Like there's a bunch. We usually have to go uh, John of the cross, John of this. Like we have to identify them because there's so many of them. So just because somebody says their name is John does not necessarily mean they're the apostle. Um, uh, and the author doesn't identify himself as much. Now, that also fits uh, John the Apostle's M.O., especially if you agree that he wrote uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, because he doesn't identify himself as the Apostle either, but you know, we're fairly certain that was him too, or at least the way I think. Um, you can disagree. Um, the other thing is that, that there's a theological difference in the way they approach God's golden age, right? So the Jewish worldview at this time, and still is to an extent, Uh, was that we live in a current broken world that is ruled by the enemy, by Satan, by the devil, and that God is eventually going to usher in, bring in a new golden age where everything is made right. God's people are put on top. uh, All the evildoers are punished in some form or another, um, and and the Messiah is the one that's going to do that. Now, in the Gospel of John, it is emphasized over and over and over that Jesus has already started to do that when he was here. Like his death and resurrection, that, that golden age started bursting into the current present evil age, and we live in a kind of time where they're, they're sandwiched against each other. Every Christian is living in both worlds. Like they're, they are a citizen of the golden age, but they're also surrounded by the present evil age, right? That's what John emphasizes in the gospel. Here, the golden age is emphasized at Christ's second coming, so when he comes back. So that's, that's different. That's not necessarily to me... Um, uh, a, a good reason to say it's not John the Apostle, uh, but it is a difference that, that is pointed to. So that's just something to bear in mind here. I, I think simply he's choosing to emphasize uh, the second coming and how God, Jesus will finally usher in the golden age completely because there will be no more sandwich. You know, the present evil age will fully end and then we'll have no one. But again, uh, I think it's just different emphasis on what the purpose of the writing is. But that's beside the point. So um, I'll let you decide, uh, you know, which, which one do you think it is? I personally am I'm, I'm okay with saying it's John the Apostle. That's probably how I will uh, view it. But either way, it, it's, there's no 100% definitive answer here. Uh, people much smarter than me stand on both sides of the argument. So, you know, do with that what you will. It makes more sense to me that this was the Apostle, but who knows? Um, that... Either way, it's somebody who is very devoted to, to Jesus and the gospel that we find in the Gospel of John and all the apostolic writings, right? All right, so that gets us to the audience. Who was he writing to? This is really easy, actually. This is one of those rare times in the New Testament. We know exactly who he was writing to. Uh, the seven churches in Asia Minor. He lists them out specifically. There was a highway in southwestern Turkey uh, where these cities are, um, that, that that just kind of goes along with the way he lists the, the cities. So, yeah, uh, this is pretty straightforward. We know exactly who he's writing to. Um, and so that gets us to the purpose. Now, to understand the purpose, we have to place ourselves at the right point in history. You know, the Bible wasn't written outside of history to be a generic anytime, anywhere. It was written at a specific point in history, a specific place in history. Um, and so there's two options for when it was written. The traditional and most popular one uh, was it was written in the mid-90s, uh, at the end of the first century, about the, sometime after 1st, um, 2nd, and 3rd th- John were written, right? So this is, this is an idea that it was late. Uh, and the historical context here is that Emperor Domitian was on the throne of Rome, um, and Domitian was a megalomaniac. He was a little bit psychotic, he was, I mean, he, and he did not like Christians. Uh, there's a famous story of him taking Jude, uh, the guy who wrote the book of Jude, um, his grandson's and trying them before his court because he, he was afraid that they were you know, descendants of this King Jesus and were going to usurp his throne. And then he looked at their hands and saw they were laborers uh, and said, now nah, I ain't worried about them anymore. Right? Like this guy was crazy and he instituted uh, the, the cult of the emperor. Like he wasn't the first guy to do this, but he definitely leaned heavily into it that you had to worship him either as a god or as a son of a god or somebody who was preferred by the gods. There, that's a lesson for a different time. Um, but regardless, he had statues set up all over the empire, and if you did not worship those statues, well, uh, you had to pay the fine, get punished, uh, and Christians wouldn't do that. So he especially didn't like that Christians didn't participate in this um, because it was definitely a means of control. Like, it, make no mistake, I don't think that they necessarily thought they were deities, most of the emperors, but that it was a means of political control, right? Um, it was an easy way to, to kind of like 
uh, get rid of political opponents who refused to worship the, the image of uh, you know these emperors. And so he was a little bit paranoid, and he, 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 he routinely made it open season to persecute Christians. It wasn't an empire-wide Christianity is illegal kind of thing. It was, if you didn't worship my statues, uh, you had to be punished, and he left it up to his local magistrates to deal with that. So it was, it was much more localized, and you know, different cities were much stricter about it than others. Um, some really didn't like Christians more so than others. Uh, and so... It was just kind of one of those things where the Christians were suffering during his reign. Okay, The other opinion is that it was written during the 60s or 70s. Uh, if you know history, you know that in the 60s uh, there was a guy named Nero who was emperor on the throne, and he was a crazy person, um, which, again, I always say you would be too if you were raised like how he was. Like, it, Go look up his story. Uh, the guy didn't stand a chance. Um, it's amazing that for the first part of his reign, he actually was decent. But towards the end, he just completely lost it. Uh, but he famously unleashed a persecution of Christians within the city of Rome, not across the whole empire, just in the city of Rome, um, because he used them as as basically scapegoat for uh, a fire that happened uh, in the city of Rome, and a large part of the city burnt down. Um, and then immediately after his suicide, the, the, the empire just really got, just nuts. There was a year where there were four emperors. So, you know, imagine having four presidents in a row, you know, like it would be turmoil just from the turnover, let alone the fact that they were killing each other. There were civil wars. Um, there was the Jewish war where the Jewish temple was completely destroyed. There's a lot of things that are like, if you look at that and then you look at Revelation, you're like, oh, well, it makes sense. There's a lot of parallels here. Um, and so there is an argument to be made that this was written early instead of at the end of the 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 first century was written towards the middle in the 60s or 70s there's a third option right and this was one that i'm new to um but it doesn't it passes the initial uh hold on a second test if you know what i mean um there's a guy named Aune, a-u-n-e is his last name and he's he's widely regarded as probably the biggest expert on the dating of revelation and his theory is that john wrote a first edition during the early date Right during the 60s and 70s. And then at the later date, in the mid-90s, he wrote a second version. Now, for those of you who are from a very um, traditional um, background, as far as Christianity goes, you hear that a book of the Bible was revised and you instantly go, no, no, that's not possible. Uh-uh, uh-uh. When, when, when it was written, it was written. Okay, um, let me kind of open your world a little bit. Uh, I don't mean to put down that worldview, but we know for a fact that there are letters we don't have in the New Testament. You know, comes to mind is the Corinthian letters. We have letters two and four. We're missing letters one and three. Um, we know we're missing the end of the Gospel of Mark. We're probably missing the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we have the Bible we are supposed to have, right? So don't mistake what I'm saying that, that we're, we don't have the whole Bible. Like, we have the Bible God wants us to have. However, it didn't start out the way it looks, okay? Uh, the Gospel of Mark had other parts to it. There are other letters that we, have from, that we don't have from Paul. It is absolutely 100% okay and makes Revelation still the divine word of God if there were two versions of it. If John was divinely inspired to revise this letter in the mid-90s within that context after he wrote it in the 60s or 70s, that's okay because God delivered it to us how it is supposed to be, okay? We can't change it now. The Bible is finalized. We're going to talk about that at the end of this study. That the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, it's done. Like We have what we're supposed to have. There's no adding to it. There's no changing it. Can't revise it 2022 edition. But it is actually okay if John, under divine inspiration, revised it. So um, that makes me kind of, you know, rethink this a little bit. I, I'm either, it's, it, for me, it's either 100% the 90s or it's, it's the, the Iun's um, understanding of it, a, a first and a second edition. Either way, I think it, it has to have at some point been revised or written during the 90s, the mid-90s of the first century, right? The reason all that matters is because it, it changes the way we understand Christians would have, the, those early Christians, the original audience would have understood it, right? Because if it was written under a time of persecution and fear and upheaval and change, 
that that makes the way they would have understood these words so much different than if it was at a time when everything was good and peaceful and happy and everything was great and peachy keen jelly bean. Like, no. The, the, it very much influences how they would have understood this and why this was written. And that gets us to the third part. Why was this written? If you put it in the context of either of those two times, you have Christians who are terrified. You know, they're seeing their world change. They're being persecuted by their government, even though they're being told by apostles to support the government. They don't know what's going to happen. They've been told Jesus is going to return, but they don't know what that looks like. They don't know when that's going to happen. They don't know how they're supposed to act between now and then. John sees that and is divinely inspired to write this down. And by divinely inspired, I mean Jesus literally said, write this down. We're going to talk about that as we get into it. Um, but if you're taking notes at home, he, th- th- let me summarize uh, it like this. And this is, I'm taking this uh, almost word for word out of the, the Cultural Study Bible. Um, it says that th- it was written to encourage Christians to stand firm against persecution and against compromise in the light of Christ's return when he will make all things right, right? So he's encouraging Christians to stand firm even though they're being persecuted. They're suffering because they're Christians and to not compromise, right? Why compromise? Compromise was a big deal in their world, and it was a problem amongst Christians was they would you know, get caught not worshiping the, 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 the statue of the emperor, and they would be tried, and a lot of times the magistrates would say, hey, just, just you know, worship the emperor. Just make a little offering. Just put a, toss a coin in. Light a candle. That's all it takes. Just do that, and you're good. But to a Christian, that's worshiping a false god. And, and John is encouraging them to, to stand firm, to show that you truly are devoted to Jesus. You're not just, you know, it's not just another religion amongst many. It's not an option amongst many. It is a true worship. It is a true faith, and that you won't compromise for the sake of saving yourself from suffering, all right? The other way to think about this is he's writing to encourage these seven churches, these Christians, by giving God's perspective on the present and the future, okay? So first, first reason is he's encouraging the Christians to stand firm against persecution and compromise in light of Christ's return when he will make all things right, Or, in other words, he's encouraging them by giving them God's perspective on the present and the future, okay? If you know what's going to happen or you know what will eventually happen, not specifically what, but specifically like this, you know, you have this to look forward to kind of deal, it can give you encouragement and strength to get through your present suffering, okay? And so that gets us to style and structure, right? Let's look at the style and structure of this letter, um... The genre itself is, is apocalypse, right? We see in the New Testament, we see histories, you know, the book of Acts. We see epistles or letters, you know, basically anything uh, Paul wrote. Uh, we see narratives, the gospels, you know, stories, you know. Um, and then we see this weird letter at the end called an apocalypse. There are other apocalypses and many apocalypses in the Old Testament. We, we see Daniel, there's portions of Isaiah, um, Ezekiel. There's there's other parts of the New Old Testament that have this, but this is the only part in the New Testament that we would consider an apocalypse. Um, the genre itself was incredibly popular around the first century. There are a lot of apocalypses, specifically Jewish apocalypses, um, that that were written at the same time as this. So this is maybe this is like the Christian version of what was popular in the Jewish world. Um, but either way, this is uh, this is a genre, right? This isn't just a weirdo one thing that John just came up with, like, I'm going to write like this. Like, no, this was a genre that people back then would have understood, oh, this is an apocalypse. Cool, let me read it. Like, I like apocalypses. Um, and so let's let's look at what that is. Like, if they were expecting an apocalypse, what is it? Like, if you're expecting a horror movie, you expect certain things. If you're expecting a comedy, you expect certain things. If you were going to read an apocalypse, what are you going to expect? Um, the first thing is to understand that it doesn't mean end of the world, right? That we know the book of Revelation by two names, the, the Revelation of John or the Apocalypse of John. Um, the word Revelation simply means something being revealed, and it is the Latin version of the word apocalypso, <laughs> which is Greek for 
something being revealed, right? Uh, so it's not necessarily about the future or the end of the world. There is a future element to it, um, but it's about something being revealed. So that's a big change to the way most people look at Revelation, that we look at it as about the future, but really it's about something being revealed. There are parts of the future being revealed, but it's primarily just a revealing revealing of something rather than just here's how the world's going to end, okay? Um, and so how do you define an apocalypse, okay? The proper definition by J.J. Collins says, a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Yeah, I got as bored with that definition as you did. Um, let me put this in layman's terms, right? So the first thing is it has a narrative framework. It has a story framework, right? Like it, 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 it operates as a story, okay? So that's the framework. That's not everything, but stuff is being revealed within the context of a narrative, of a story. It has a beginning, has an end, okay? In that story, there is an otherworldly being, it doesn't, in Revelation, it's Jesus, but in other apocalypses, we see, you know, it can be demons, it can be angels, it can be spirits, it can be like, there's there's a bunch of different things it could be. It's an otherworldly being revealing something to a human, to a human recipient, okay? So we have a story in which a supernatural otherworldly being is revealing something to a human. The thing that they reveal is a reality bigger than their own, right? It was transcendent reality, which transcendent just means it's bigger than, than the world that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So they reveal this reality that's bigger than their own. It's more than what you can see and observe. And it's spatial and it's um, temporal, which means it, it operates within time. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it operates within our time or within a timeline we have, but it operates within time, like an event will happen at this time kind of deal, right? And within space means it, it happens within a, a physical space, not necessarily our space or our dimension, but it happens with, within a real space, okay? Um, and so that's, that, that, that's basically how it works. It is a story in which a supernatural, otherworldly being reveals a bigger reality than our own to a human that happens within real time and real space, not necessarily our time or our space. Okay? Is everybody following me? These are big words. This is big, crazy concepts. This is part of the reason why this letter is so hard to study. All right? Now, some other characteristics. Um, usually it was written uh, pseudo, pseudon, pseudonymous um, basically means it was written, the author wouldn't claim the authorship. They would instead write as if they were somebody famous from the past, a, a spiritual authority from the past. That's why like we see uh, first, second, Enoch, um, fourth, Ezra, like those are written as if they're written by these spiritual beings. Like, you know, we looked at that during our study of Jude, how he quotes Enoch in the book of Enoch. He, it's supposedly written by Enoch and he claims a spiritual authority because he's this big, massive, important figure from the past. So that makes it weird that John claims authorship. So he's kind of, you know, genre busting here a little bit. Um, normally, apocalypses describe great upheaval that is done at the hand of, of God as he makes things right. And it normally concludes, especially the Jewish apocalypses, uh, with God ushering in a golden age where all things are made right. Okay? So that's, that's basically what you would expect to find in an apocalypse. And we see that here for the most part, all right? So that gets us to the structure, right? This last part's going to go kind of quick. Um, how is it structured? Um, the problem with this, you know, if you look at your Bible and you're like, here's the outline, pretty much everybody has a different outline because uh, it doesn't structure itself very easily, especially in the eyes of a modern person. Modern Western world and this, like, we don't think the same as the way they would have back then. Um, a really common way to try to, to outline this is um, to look at the, the sevens, like do the sevens but that kind of falls apart after the last bowl is poured. So I'm, we're not going to do that because it doesn't, it doesn't keep us consistent, keep us on track. Um, another uh, really good way is called chiastic, the chiastic, and that's a fancy word, which just kind of means the middle is the key to understanding what happens before and what happens after, okay? Um, and so it's, it's kind of 
point A, point B, point C, then point B, then point A. Kind of like uh, unfolds, if that makes sense. Like the middle part is the important part, and then it kind of repeats itself. Uh, the further out, the the more repeti- repetitive it is, if that makes sense. Um, so in, in the case of Revelation chapters 11, 12, the, the martyrdom of the two witnesses uh, and the beast of the heart, those are kind of like the central uh, important change moments. Like those will inform what happens before and what happens after, okay? But I that falls apart a little bit too, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so we're going to um, be studying this with the understanding that it is recapitulatory, right? Um, and this is this is something that doesn't get taught very often, which is really shocking. Uh, I first came across this when uh, I took a revelation class at Bible College. Um, go Dr. Ford. Um, and it's 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 the one that makes the most sense, like to me, like without a doubt, it makes the most sense. Um, and it's also the earliest. Like we have from the second century, uh, people explaining Revelation using a recapitulatory structure. Um, Bishop Victorian, Victorinus of Patau was writing in the second century. That is, I mean, that's, that's, he could have talked to people who were there kind of deal. Like this is quick, this is early, that this is the, the way they understood the structure of Revelation. Uh, in order to understand this, you have to remember one big thing about God. He is not confined by time, right? God views existence like a painting. He can see it all at once. He can do things all over the painting anywhere he wants. He doesn't operate within time like you and I do. You and I operate within time like a movie. We are temporal in that we experience it as we go through it. We can't see it all at once. We don't know what's going to happen next. That's, that's the way we experience time. That's not the way God experiences time. And so if you understand that God operates outside of time, you can see it all at once, the recap- recapitulatory idea makes sense. It makes perfect sense, and it actually makes the, the whole book work a whole lot easier. Um, so instead of it being like a narrative in the sense of it's just one straight line, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, uh, we, we, it operates, there is forward movement, but it's kind of a spiraling moving forward. All right? Now this is something that... Um, w- you, you will talk about a lot because it's a new concept to most. Um, but instead of it being just like this, 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 it, it, it goes to this point and it tells the story and then it circles back to that same starting point and it tells the same story again but with more urgency. And then it circles back again to that same starting point. It tells it that same story again but with even more urgency and it circles back and it just keeps doing that. It, it recycles, it recapitulates until eventually it moves on to the end, right? So it's still a narrative but it, it, it has a repetition which if you remember from our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, this is John's writing style. <laughs> he likes to repeat himself, over and over and over. Topic A, then topic B, and then topic A, topic B with a little bit of topic C. A, B, C, a little bit of topic D. And he just keeps, you know, right? Recapitulation is the way John the Apostle wrote. Uh, And so it makes sense that he would write this in this method. All right? I guarantee I'll have questions on that. (laughs) So please reach out to me. Like I say at the end of every one of these videos and podcasts, uh, I would love to try to explain this a little bit more to you. I know it's difficult, but hang in there. Remember that word. I wouldn't say Google it because you probably get weird stuff uh, that doesn't explain it very well. But it, it's hold on to that. All right, we're going to talk about it more and more. All right, that gets us to interpretation, and this is kind of a hot button topic, uh, and this is one I have very strong feelings about because to misinterpret this any more than we we do already, like we're all flawed, we're all broken, it can really do damage, right? Uh, and so there are three ways throughout history that people have understood this letter, okay? The way they have tried to interpret the parts that we go, what's that mean, okay? The first is the early church, and that's, I'm part of the restoration movement. Our entire MO is, what did the early church do? What did the earliest Christians do? Let's kind of base our stuff on that. So that is the method that I'm going to use throughout this thing. Uh, sorry if that bursts some bubbles. Um, I'm not going to explain it because I'll be explaining that as we study this, right? The second way was made popular by St. Augustine, um, and it kind of gets finds its roots in his work, The City of God, which if you're looking for light reading or something to really expand your mind, don't read it because it is difficult. It's just not an easy read. Um, I've tried like three times, and I, I don't know that I still have finished it. <laughs> uh, but it is difficult, but basically he proposes the idea that 
Uh, there's the city of God, and then there's the city of the rest of humanity, and they're constantly like kind of fighting with each other. And so he viewed um, Revelation as the history of the church between the first and second coming of Christ, like specifically about the church, about the city of God. That is That was kind of the first popular view after the early church period. Um, the, the Middle Ages saw the rise of another worldview, uh, specifically in the 12th century, and um, this is kind of the one that's that's been the most popular all the way up to recent times. Um, it was first we can trace it back to a guy named uh, Joachim of Fiore. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, um, but he viewed Revelation not just as the the history of the church, but as all of human history. Like he views it as the history of the entire world until Christ returns. And so, with this worldview, you read Revelation trying to decode it with what it really means based on the world around you, right? Let me explain what I mean by this. You have an orientation, so you're either looking at the past, you're looking at the present, or you're looking at the future. You have this orientation, right? You're either past-focused, present-focused, future-focused. You read Revelation, and you decode what you read based on your understanding of it and your orientation. Right, so you read something, and I'm making this completely up. There's, I don't think there's any part of Revelation that says. It. Let's say that, you know, it says that there's a great dog that eats a cow in a field. Okay, if you're past focused, you'd be like, man, that sounds like a war. Like a dog ate an innocent cow in a field. It's like a, a, a army slaughtering innocents, you know, in a field. And you'd look back through history and you'd say, oh yeah, Hitler did that in this field. That was then. And you would decode that verse to mean Hitler did that then, right? Present focused. You'd say, oh man, Russia is is attacking Ukraine, you know, unwarranted aggression against that. You'd say, oh, that's that. Uh, future focused, you'd be like, well, we don't know, but we're looking towards the future. It could be when P Putin does this or when so-and-so does this, right? That's, that's the way that this view of interpreting works. And it has some really big problems, right? You assign to Revelation, number one, things that were never meant to be assigned to it, right? That, that is the biggest problem with this, is you put meaning into the Bible, that's how cults start. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, growing up, there was uh, several spots because in the 1800s, it was really popular to predict the end of the world. They called it Millerism. Um, and there was one spot, uh, Canner's Cave, uh, near in Jackson County, Ohio, where a group of people just like some dude predicted the end of the world. So they all gathered there and they stayed there. And I think they ended up staying like two or three weeks before they're like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Bye bye. Right. But like that, that, that's what happens when you do this. You predict the end of the world when Jesus said, nah, you can't predict the day. Even Jesus didn't know the day. Only the Father does. When we put meaning into the Bible, that's a bad thing. Right. That's not taking meaning out of it and applying it to our lives. And that was not the reason John wrote this at all. He was not giving it to us that we can figure out the end. He was writing, again, explicitly to encourage the faithful to stand firm against persecution and compromise in light of Christ's return when he will make all things right. It was about taking this meaning and applying it to our lives, not putting meaning into it. It misses the point of revelation entirely when we do this, okay? It is about the future. There are things in there that are future-oriented that will happen that haven't yet, but it's not our job to decode them. And so proper interpretation is going to do four things. All right? Number one, a proper interpretation approach is always going to approach Revelation as a witness to God's actions on behalf of his creation. By the way, this is a large part of this is coming from an uh, author named... Um, Mangina, maybe M-A-N-G-A-I-N-A, -A -A. Um, awesome book, uh, I definitely recommend it, um, but the, he's, he's going to be essential to this, him and, and a guy named Barr, which we'll talk about him in a second, uh, but we approach Revelation as a witness to God's actions on behalf of his creation, okay, what God has done to save his creation, to fix his creation, to make his creation new, right, we approach Revelation as a witness to God's actions on behalf of his creation. We approach Revelation as the revelation of Jesus himself, right? Jesus had a message for these seven churches, right? So we are supposed to understand it as this is Jesus' message, a revelation of Jesus himself. 
Next, we're supposed to approach Revelation as an instrument of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, this is the this is this is a big big deal. So we have what God has done, what Jesus has revealed, and how the Holy Spirit is working. That is how we're supposed to approach Revelation, right? There are a few other things. We're always supposed to read it within the context of the rest of the Bible. Revelation is not going to counteract any other part of the Bible. That's part of what makes the Bible complete. You can't add to it anymore because it agrees with itself. There's a homogenization there. And so we have to read Revelation. If you think it's saying something that contradicts another part of the Bible, you might need to pump the brakes and reevaluate your understanding of it. And the last thing is we should always stay within the context of the original authorship, audience, and background. Right? You, you can't... You can't add 21st century understandings of things. You can't add 21st century technologies or, or, or uh, philosophies or, or questions to something that was written in the first century. We have to stay within our historical context, okay? And that gets us to the end of today's, today's uh, study. Like, we're not even going to read any of Revelation today. This is all context. Um, how are we going to break it down? How are we going to outline it? Um, this is just, there, there's no right or wrong way to do this. This is just simply, it's going to make it easier for us as we go through it. So we're going to break down Revelation into three parts. And this is 100% stealing from a guy named David Barr. Um, and so he basically, he breaks it down into three stories. He calls them scrolls. We're going to call them stories. Uh, and each of these stories take place in a different location. And they all focus on the different roles of the Messiah. Right? So within the Bible, the Messiah has three roles. In each one of these stories, Jesus operates within one of those three roles. All right, so the first story is chapters 1 through 3. Um, and this is what we're calling the letter story, what David is calling the letter story. It takes place on the island of Patmos. And here we see Jesus as the revealer or the prophet. Right? So that's the messianic role he's fulfilling. He is the prophet or the revealer. This is the part of the Bible where he reveals himself to John and he dictates these letters to the seven churches. And that's chapters 1 through 3. The next part we're going to call the worship story. This is uh, chapter 4 through chapter 11, verse 18. Um, and this is, uh, it happens in the throne room of heaven, right? So the first one takes place on the island of Patmos. Uh, this one takes place in the throne room of heaven, and it's called the worship story. And here Jesus operates as the lamb or the priest, right? So that, that role of the, of the Messiah is, is the priest, the lamb, all right? The, the one who, who mediates between humanity and God. And the third story is the, the war story, right? This is chapter 11, verse 19, through the end of the book, chapter 22. Um, and this takes place on earth, but it's a different earth from what John knew, right? It's still earth, but it's different. Um, uh, it, it, in the future, it's changed. It, it's different. It's a different earth than what he knew, but it's still earth. Um, and here Jesus operates as the warrior or the king, right? Messiah is the king of the new golden age, right? He is, he is our king. We, we say that when we get baptized, uh, we, we accept him as our Lord, our king and savior, all right? So that's how we're going to break it down. Three stories. We're going to get through this. It's going to be a long time probably, but I'm really excited about it slash intimidated. So if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, be kind. Uh, you know, I, I don't, again, don't pretend to have all the answers, uh, but I hopefully can help you understand this, this very impactful and meaningful letter a little bit better. As always, see you next week.